Just like the ones in Germany Where in treetops that glisten The Krampus still listens To the sounds of the screaming down below And I'm dreaming of a fright-filled Christmas with every podcast that I write May your days be merry and bright And may your Christmas turn scary at night Oh, I'm dreaming of a fright-filled Christmas just like the ones in Germany Where der bell schnickel tickles Those children who've been fickle While Frau Perchdott spills their entrails on the floor I'm dreaming of a white Christmas just like Icelandic yesteryears Where the Gryla comes a-striding Her children bring bad tidings As they steal all the children And cook them in their stew What's up, everybody? Welcome, and happy Christmas, Hana Kwanzaa, and happy Winter Solstice. This is episode 221, our Christmas special part two, the sequel episode to our famously infamous Christmas special five years ago from episode 17. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that episode is... Um, one of our favorites, as well as a listener favorite as well. We've got nothing but love about that episode. Um, I think we've reposted it a few times as well throughout history. So if you have a drive ahead of you, or you just want to know more about the history of old Santa Claus and all his, uh, you know, creepy companions, then please go back and listen to, or even re-listen to episode 17. No, I have a, I have a, I have a question. Did we mm -hmm. just cover Santa Claus on that one? Because I thought there was an episode, you know, past Christmases that we did where uh, we talked about the Killy Krampos, um, and uh, we did a couple of the other famous Santa Claus, you know, esque characters. Um, but well, I was trying to go back the the other day and find it, and I couldn't. I'm like, fuck! Did we just do one massive episode, or? Uh, Am I, I think am, am it I, was uh, just one massive episode. Oh. I yeah. thought maybe, uh, you know, uh, I'm having like, uh, you know, the Berenstein Bear complex <laughs> going on. And uh, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah you're having a Mandela yeah. effect. I do yeah. believe that on that episode, we talked about pretty much everything on that episode. It was the Anamita Muscaria mushroom. It was drinking moose piss that was laced with uh, shrooms. It was a lot of crazy stuff. But now you got me wondering, because you could be right. <laughs> this whole time I've been thinking that we just did all that on episode 17, and I could easily be wrong. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the, the moose piss and everything else took so much of our time that that was like one. And then the next year we reposted it. And then the following year, you're like, come on, let's do another Christmas special. So that's no, I don't when. No, because the, the explanation for episode 17 is the special episode Sean and Preston take a trip back in time to examine the inspiration behind the modern day incarnation of Santa Claus. 
discuss some of the Jolly Fat Man's traditional dastardly companions, psychedelic mushrooms, and more. And that has oh. that uh, Fright Christmas song as our intro. So I don't know. I think I'm right. I think I'm right. Oh. Not that, you I was know. Hoping you're, I was hoping you were wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you can prove me wrong, I'll take it. That's what the listeners are for. <laughs> Let the listeners decide. Well, right now, coincidentally, we are amidst the winter solstice. Today is actually December 21st as we are recording this episode. So it indeed is the winter solstice. That is the shortest day where the sun sets the earliest and the moon comes out the soonest. And it's the time when we're close to that liminal period where the veil's a little bit thinner and the dead become a little closer, you know, to earth. And we're able to see through the veil and see the spirits of our, our loved ones and other creepy companions of, you know, holiday celebrations. And with that special Christmas episode, we talked about Krampus. And we talked about Frau Perchta and the Belschnickel and all these other great, you know, creepy companions to Santa Claus. But of course, that wasn't the only set of companions that he has. So on this episode, it is going to be the five-year sequel to our holiday special back in 2016. And we've got four more freaky Festivus fiends to talk to you about on this special episode. Now at the top of our list of these four freakish fiends, we're going to start off with one that's a little more recognizable, the Snabble Perched or the Perchton. Now, if you remember Frau Perchta, she was this creepy female figure who would come into your house, and if you've been a bad little boy or a bad little girl, she would take her knife out of her back pocket. She'd cut you open from chest to genitals, pull out all your insides, and then fill your belly back up with straw and rocks. Well, if that's not bad enough, presto, can you imagine a whole slew of those things running around, an entire gang of perched ends that are just cutting open bellies and shoving them full of rocks. Mmm. Yeah, it sounds fucking terrifying. Well, the Schnabel perched or the perched in is more or less a group of these creatures who wander silently around the streets and their job is to inspect your house before Santa Claus arrives and make sure that you've dusted all the cobwebs, swept out all the corners, taken the trash out and so on and so forth. Now, these creatures are short and stocky, oftentimes furry, wearing torn-up robes and hand-stitched clothes, with long hoods and a long, leathery, bird-like beak. Now, in one hand, they carry a broom. In the other hand, they carry a big gunny sack. And in their waist is tucked a giant pair of rusty scissors. Now, as the Epiphany draws nearer and Santa Claus is making his rounds, their job is to show up unexpectedly to your home and inspect it to make sure it's as clean as it can possibly be for old Santa Claus. They want to make sure that your fireplace and chimney are swept out. Like I said earlier, no cobwebs, no dirt, no junk anywhere. And if they decide that your house is clean enough for the jolly old fat man to visit, then they simply give you a few silver coins, pat you on the head, and move on to your neighbor's house. Now, if you're lucky enough to escape with just that, then you consider yourself pretty fortunate. Because if they happen to come into your house and you've been lazy or sloppy, and they notice that you got a little bit of dirt and stuff piled up around the door frame, or maybe your kids got some toys and some trash under their bed, they'll take the giant pair of scissors, cut you from navel to naughty bits, pull out all your insides just like Frau Perchta, and then fill you up with all the dirt and rocks and trash and cobwebs they find in your house and then stitch you back up. But because they have no patience, if they do it too fast or too hard and they happen to kill you, well, that's where the bag on their back comes into play. They'll simply scoop you up, toss you in the sack, and then carry your happy ass out of the house like nothing ever happened. Simply terrifying. Now, in other accounts, the Perchton are actually a merry band of many Krampuses. In certain beliefs in certain regions of Europe, Frau Perchta is said to fly through the sky 
just before Santa Claus with a merry band of mini Krampuses. And essentially they do the same thing. They inspect the house, make sure the toys are all cleaned up, make sure your clothes are all clean, your shoes are all tidy. And if they happen to come into your house, they'll do the exact same thing. Rip you open from chest to your junk and just shove in all sorts of nasty crap, stitch you back up and leave you there. Hopefully you're a nicer little boy or little girl next year. Depending where you live in the regions of the United Kingdom and over in Europe, you may come across something a little nicer and a little more cute. Now in our house, Presto, we begin collecting little gnomes. These little gnomes that have the big old long hats with the little, you know, frou-frou pom-pom on the end, big old long beards, big old fat noses, and dangly legs. I think there's like 40 of them throughout our house. Now, I thought they were cute, like they were little mini Santa Clauses and had no idea what the hell they were. Uh-oh. But have you ever heard of Der Yulnisi or the Tom Tanisi? No. Not till I read the, the article before the show. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so the Tom T and the Nisi essentially are no strangers to pixelated paranormal because we've talked about them before. Way back on the old episodes of Thieves in the Night. And other episodes about the Hilderfirk. What the Tomtees and the Nieces and Der Yule Nieces are, are short little diminutive gnome like creatures with red caps, big old long bushy beards, that inhabit farmhouses and live under your floorboards or within your walls. Now, for 364 days a year, they help you tend to your cattle, they tend to your crops. They clean up little messes if you were too tired to get your work done, if you fell asleep too soon. And they live underneath your floorboards. Now, the way you keep the Tomty and the Nisi happy is you would leave out their favorite food, a little bowl of porridge. You put Ooh. one pat of butter on the top, nice and hot, and you leave it by a doorstep or maybe outside, you know, underneath your porch. Now, like I said, 364 days a year, the Tomty and the Nisi help tend to your cattle, make sure they're fed. You may go to bed one night and realize, oh, crap, I forgot to wash the horses and I forgot to comb their manes out. And the next morning you wake up and you realize the horses have been tended to completely. Beautiful, shiny coats, beautiful braids in their, in their manes and so on and so forth. All you have to do is leave the occasional bowl of porridge. But since they live underneath your floorboards, it's common practice, or rather common courtesy, if you spill something, to give them a friendly heads up. If you spill boiling hot water, if you're making tea or soup, or you drop something dirty on the floor that might go through the floorboards, the one thing that will piss off the Tomty and the Nisi is to have stuff spilled on them or have their own homes underneath your floorboards, dirty and disheveled. So if you do something to upset the Tomty and the Nisi, then you can expect a variety of different punishments, ranging anywhere from something simple, like they might tickle your toes when you're trying to fall asleep or clap you on the ears when you're not looking. They might pinch you on the behind or poke your belly. But if things get bad enough and you don't respect the Tomty and the Nisi, and you don't leave out the bowls of porridge, or in some cases, if your kid's too much of a little bastard and sees a bowl of porridge sitting on the doorstep and runs over and eats it, you may suffer far more worse punishments. The Tomty and the Nisi are said to actually go as far as to slaughter entire herds of cattle and burn down barns if they feel like they've been disrespected. But if you mind your P's and Q's all 364 days of the year, then these creepy little shape-shifting gnomes may appear to you on the 25th of December as the beloved legendary Yule Nisi. Essentially, a merry band of tiny little Santa Clauses. They'll show up, and they'll shine your shoes, they'll deliver toys to all the little kids, they'll bring you little workhorses and little airplanes and everything else, just like Santa Claus's gnome, I'm sorry, Santa Claus's elves, but they themselves act as a giant gang of Santa Clauses. Some even have been said to show up to your doorstep riding the famous Yule Goat. 
Now, as cutesy and fun as that might be, as our show often does, we have to take a bit of a dark turn. So, Preston, why don't you talk about our third creature, Hans Trop? For as long as there has been a jolly old Saint Nick providing gifts for well-behaved children, there has been someone or something else filling the role of his counterpart, punishing the bastards and the naughty ones. These fearsome figures range from iconic horned Krampus to Perchta, the shape-shifting Christmas tree witch who fills the disobedient children's bellies with straw. The terrifying Hans Trop is probably the worst of them all. The legend of the Christmas Scarecrow is well known in the French regions of Alsace and and Lorraine. Lorraine. I will go with it. (laughs) <laughs> Hans Trop, according to the story, lived in the 1400s, a rich, powerful, merciless man who was feared by the people of Alsace. His thirst for power was so great that he turned to deals with the devil to enhance his power and status. Hearing of this, the Pope himself excommunicated Trop, after which he was banished from Alsace and his wealth and lands were confiscated, all of which is nothing compared to what came next. When he returned to Alsace, he was ostracized by the local people. Everyone fled from him as he was a wild beast. His money and lands were confiscated and he was left penniless like a beggar. They say he was forced into exile in the forest and isolated himself from the rest of society. He found shelter on the mountain of Griesberg in Bavaria, Germany, where he built himself a makeshift shack from sticks. Solitude drove him batshit crazy, and he spent his days brooding and dreaming of revenge. His anger and resentment were intensified, and he became more deeply devoted to Satanism. Descending into madness, Hans Trop began to dream of eating human flesh. The evil man was obsessed with his desire to bite into flesh of a human arm, leg, thigh, yeah, whatever he could get his little grubby hands on. <laughs> he roamed the countryside and disguised himself as a scarecrow by stuffing his ragged clothes with straw. He spent his time gathering sticks and hay in the field and laying in wait, looking for the perfect victim. A boy, God, this story's going to get dark, around <laughs> age 10, happened across his past one day, and uh, as he stared at the young boy, Trump began to drool at the mouth, imagine biting into his delicious and tender flesh. Nom, nom. He was going to have himself some boy chops. Ew. Before the boy knew what was <laughs> happening, Hans Trop pounced, attacking him viciously and running him through with a sharpened stick. Then he dragged the dying child back to his shack where he cut the boy into small pieces and roasted him open an open fire. With the body safely back in his lair, Trop sliced uh, into the pieces and roasted it, but before he could eat, he was struck by a divine lightning bolt and killed. (laughs) Fuck yeah, Jesus. (laughs) Came to save the day. (laughs) I like how normally, you know, Jesus and God and Santa Claus kind of, you know, stay at opposite ends of the table, but this one time, God's like, no, fuck that guy. Yeah. Boom! <laughs> Holy light. I don't care if your creepy little friends cut people open to shove rocks inside their bellies and straw, but you don't fuck eating kids. That's right. You could say that God was basically fed up with Han's evil doing. So today, his spirit lingers and he lives on dressed as a scarecrow. Because Hans is uh, stuck in some sort of purgatory, he uh, works with Santa Claus to earn redemption. We have a, a good cop, bad cop scenario here where Santa gives the good kids present while Hans punishes the naughty kids. Anywhere from whipping them to poking them with sharp sticks to maybe even nibbling on their toes as they sleep. Good God. Mm-hmm. And for the worst of them, he's said to drag them into the forest never, ever, ever to be seen again. And from then on, the figure of Hans Trop is a warning to children to be good, or he will use his scarecrow's disguise to trick them and carry their naughty little bastard children off into the dark forest, never to be seen again. God. He really yeah. is the Christmas boogeyman. Yeah. So surprisingly enough, Hans Trop was legitimately a real guy. So Hans von Trotha was a knight who lived, uh, believed to be between 1450 to 1503. 
Hans commanded two castles on the Palatine, which is the French and German territory, but became embroiled in an argument with the church over the property in one of them, over the property of one of them. The church's abbot wouldn't concede certain properties to von Trotha, so the embittered knights stopped the supply of water to the nearby tan town of Wiesenberg by building a dam. So in retaliation, the abbot had the dam destroyed, which flooded the villagers' homes and businesses. This fight continued until, just as a tale of Hans Tropp, the knight was summoned by the Pope himself and thus excommunicated. Now, there's no real regard or detailed reports of Trotha turning into cannibalism and hunting children while dressed as a scarecrow, but what is known of Hans von Trotha's life is so extraordinary. Even the Emperor's invitation wasn't enough to put the stop to the knight's battle with the abbot of Wiesenberg Abbey, which is exactly why the Pope Innocent VIII came into the picture at first place. In first place. On a summoning to the successor of Alexander VI Papal Court, von Trotha refused to attend the party, and instead he sent a letter to the Pope which expounded on von Trotha's faith while accusing the Pope of all manners of impure acts and no-nos. Even though he was excommunicated, the wily von Trotha did well for himself. Serving as the French royal court, he was given the cavalier door by the king, Louis VII, and on his death, all charges against him were finally reversed and forgiven. Something of his notoriety lived on, though, well past his legend of being Hans Trapp. Local legends also refer to him as the Black Knight, a formidable specter who was sometimes said to accompany Santa Claus and punish children who were unworthy of Santa Claus's gifts. Yeah, so it sounds like Santa Claus travels around with not only Krampus and Frau Perchta, but also a Black Knight. Well, our fourth and final creature we're going to talk about tonight, I saved the best for last. Preston, before this episode's document, have you ever heard of the Mari Lut? No, I, I haven't. But uh, the uh, image that you have on there reminds me of um, kind of um, northern Native American uh, depictions of the uh, Wendigo. Yeah, yeah, kind of similar. I'm not sure if you've ever watched my uh, favorite horror film of all time, The Return of the Living Dead. But the Tar Man looks awful, an awful lot like the Mari Lud. <laughs> so basically, if a Wendigo had a baby with the Tar Man, you'd get this freak. Mm-hmm. So we all know the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. We celebrate, well, several people, a lot of people celebrate his birth every year on the day of December 25th, right? We know this mm -hmm. tale is thus. Joseph rushes his very pregnant wife, Mary, into a manger where by the grace of God, little baby Jesus is born. But just like when we covered this on our first episode of Thieves in the Night and dove into the story of the ill-fated demon Lilith, it seems that on the night of our dear Savior's birth, another fiendish creature was born. As the stable men rushed around to make room for Joseph and Mary, clearing out the manger and preparing this new area for the child's birth, they were faced with another pregnancy dilemma. See, there was a beautiful gray mare sitting amongst the hay who was so far into her own pregnancy, she was about to burst any moment. Well, the story goes on as we know it. The animals were all shooed away from the manger and the horse was simply shuffled outside into the cold night and sadly forgotten about. And thus the beautiful and pregnant mare wandered through the countryside as she looked for a safe, warm place to have her foal. But sadly, this beautiful gray mare had no luck. And as the moonlight soaked the countryside and the newborn baby was crying from somewhere away in some manger in a makeshift bassinet, the beautiful pregnant mare succumbed to the elements and sadly passed away. And as the old Welsh tale goes on, years later, many villagers during the night of Christmas through the following 12 days following would report something bizarre, ethereal, and unexplainable happening throughout the countryside. Late at night, after nightfall, as folks would be settling down from dinner, 
filling up a cup for mead or curling up by the fire. They begin hearing the neighs of a horse outside, snorting and banging at the windows. And they'd also hear tapping and scratching at the window sills. Then suddenly they would hear the cries of a woman. Please, please, it's cold out here. Please let me inside where I might warm myself. Then later on, please, please, perhaps a meal I could eat as well. I'm famished. I've been walking around for what feels like eternity. And suddenly a frost would then settle across the candlelit windows and heavy breathing could be heard. And the voice would get deeper and make its way towards the front door where suddenly heavy fists would pound at the door. If you were foolish enough or perhaps smart enough to answer the door, you'd be met by a specifically horrific sight. Standing in your doorframe, staring back at you, would be the skull of a horse, its flesh dried and wrinkled, its lips long since rotted away, its teeth gnashing at the cold air, tongue whipping around wildly. But perhaps even more terrifying of all things was the beast's eyes. They were large, like Christmas tree baubles, yellow and sun-bleached, they would dance back and forth, darting wildly every which way, searching for a place to lay and rest. Its long flowing mane would be wafting in the air with beautiful colored ribbons, tangled and torn. Its humanoid body resembles that of a skeleton, wrapped in a torn white robe, with the flesh of the creature's body hanging from the bones and two long claw-like hands dangling by its side. But this creature is quite different from the counterparts of Krampus and Der Belschnickel. Oh no, Preston, it doesn't want you or your kids. Mm. It simply wants your booze and your leftovers. Once you open the door and you're faced with the merry loot, she'll begin to ask to come inside for a place to warm herself and perhaps for a cup of mead and maybe some leftover roast or potato or two. But if you deny her, she'll simply begin to sing you a song. Something simple and short, like a child's rhyme or perhaps a riddle. Once she's finished, her bulging eyes will rest upon you with the expectation of one of two things. To simply invite her inside, or, if you're bold enough, to challenge her back with a different song or riddle of your own. As the challenge continues, her words will become more humorous and she'll begin to start teasing you with coy riddles and rude songs, maybe even popping in an adult joke or two. But this is where the real fun ensues, see? If you're chosen to challenge the Mari Lute in her makeshift rap battle, the rules are simple. The first person to laugh is the loser. If the Mari Lute laughs first, she'll bow and simply run off into the darkness of the night. But if you happen to giggle first, Mari Loot will rush past you into your house and begin pilfering your cabinets, eating your food, gnashing your bread, eating your roast, and chugging all your booze. And there simply isn't a thing you can do about it to stop this onslaught, because if you find yourself so brave as to try to forcibly remove the Mari Loot, She'll turn around and pin you down to the ground and tickle you and pinch you and poke you, relentlessly making fun of you. Then she'll stand back up and rush around your home, pocketing your trinkets and your silverware, before snagging one last cup of mead for the road. Then she'll burst out your front door, laughing into the night. So, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. You're not going to get your belly cut open. You're not going to be hauled away in some sack and eaten in the woods, but you're also going to get robbed and someone's going to drink all your fucking Bud Light. Yeah, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure how I feel about that. <laughs> right? Now, what's interesting here is, you know, we have traditions of the past similar to Krampus Knock, um, festivals and parades and, cel and celebrations and so forth. You also have celebrations of the Mari Lute. 
Now, what's interesting about this is the celebration started off as a tradition for poor people to wander around the village and beg richer folk for coins and food and drinks to somehow relinquish them of their sins and their, you know, lesser survival. And this has somehow turned into a more common tradition of people taking a pole and erecting a long flowing white robe, a horse's skull, Christmas baubles for eyes, and long colorful ribbons. A band of normally seven or eight people will then walk around from door to door singing carols and singing riddles and telling rude jokes. And essentially the same challenge is offered. If they knock on your door and you answer, they'll sing you a song. If you sing one back, they may leave or they may offer back another joke or another rude recoil. If you are to lose, then you have to allow them to come inside and have a drink and have a bite to eat. So kind of similar to um, Christmas carolers. So how would you like that, man? You answer the door and some kind of bug-eyed horse monsters banging on your door want you to let it in to have all your booze. Um, I'd be like, let me go get my fucking shotgun and you can get the fuck off my doorstep. But I don't know if that works, man. You know, we've watched Evil Dead. It seems as though shotguns don't really have much of an effect on these kind of things. So, uh, it's, uh, I mean, my boomstick. Your That's boomstick. what I meant. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's my favorite of the four uh, creatures I came across is the Mary Loot. It sounds like, uh, I can't even imagine, man. Extremely creepy. Like I said, kind of like the tar man just rotting, falling apart on your front door. Or I might be like, listen, bitch, uh, let's have a drinking uh, game. And if I drink you under the table, then uh, you got to give me like a year supply of booze for free uh-huh. and then start knocking back shots and see what happens. <laughs> I think what happens is you call me the next morning and say, Sean, it took yeah. all my booze. A giant bug eyed <laughs> horse monster came to my house and stole all my beer. <laughs> oh. Well, folks, we hope you have a happy and merry Christmas, Mahana Kwanzaa, and whatever else you might celebrate. We hope that you enjoyed this episode, and please go back and re-listen to episode 17. Brush up on your knowledge of where mushrooms inspired Santa Claus and how reindeer can jump over the, you know, the yurts up there in Alaska. And then regale such tales to your parents and your aunts and uncles and grandparents, and watch how they giggle with joy of all that you've taught them. Or they ask you mm. to leave Christmas early. Which might be a blessing in disguise. You never know. So it <laughs> could, could, be a, could be a win-win for everybody. Yeah, you, know? you never know. That's why all we ask is that you try. Yeah. All righty. Well, if you're on the old social medias, pop in and see us on the old Instagram, PXL Paranormal. Check us out on the Facebook, The Pixelated Paranormal Podcast. We have a Twitter. We never use it. I should probably lock in just so a bot doesn't take us over. Preston, what do you have? Well, let me uh, jump on to the old, uh, holy crap, we're up to 152 subscribers on YouTube. So uh, I think last episode we were only like, you know, 100 and 42, 143, so we've we've gained a couple since then, so that's good. Oh, yeah. Good. Outstanding. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, you know, as always, get yourself over to YouTube, like and subscribe, share it with all your friends, because, you know, some people don't use a podcast app, so they can catch the show on YouTube. And, uh, I mean, as always, if uh, you need a beard, if you want a beard... If uh, you don't want a dirty hobo Hans Trop beard, then uh, do yourself a favor this holiday season and go over to BigDobsBeardBomb.com and use promo code PXLPARA for 20% off your order. And pick yourself up some scents like Bay Rum, uh, Sweet Tobacco, Fresh Citrus, Classic, and Mint. And uh, your, your beard will be phenomenal and you'll thank us. And how. And even though it's too late now, it does make a good stocking stuffer or a great way to celebrate the new year. Yeah. And the word on the street is if you may have missed his awesome barrel aged beard oil, there may be some more of that uh, cooking up right now. All right, as always, if you're in the Wichita area, please stop by and see Leslie and the gang at CD Trade Post. Pop in, tell them Pixelated Paranormal sent you. And otherwise, short and sweet, just like the Tom T. Nisi, 
We're going to jump out of here, folks, and go enjoy the rest of this beautiful winter solstice. On behalf of Steve, cheers to the weird shit in the world and to those of us that love to talk about it. And stay spooky and stay on the Paranormal Highway. The cast that Pixelated Paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the Paranormal Highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. Email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange.